Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're finally going to be looking at every single Zelda game and I'll be ranking them off of my own preferences. My preferences are set out as a sort of criteria that you'll be able to see before I start talking about every single game, set out in a sort of bar fashion to give you a visual representation of what I think to each section in each of the games. So the first category that I'll be ranking the games on is dungeons. Some of you will know that I'm a sucker for dungeons so that isn't that much of a surprise. The next is the open world, specifically how good the open world is. Just because the world is giant doesn't mean that it would land a top spot in this list. Next is one of the most important things whenever I discuss my Zelda games, the story and atmosphere, and how they interact with each other to create an immersive world. My final criteria is items. I think that in some cases how you interact with the world can increase my enjoyment of a Zelda game substantially. So while there are other criteria that could have taken this spot instead, I do think that the way in which we use the world can play enough of a significant part that it deserves to be here. Please note that this is my opinion and everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Respectful discussions are more than welcome down below in the comments, but keep in mind it's just my own preferences. One last thing before I get into my longest video I've ever made is that I made this within a week and it took a ton of work, like a, a real crazy amount of work, so please do like the video if you enjoy any of it. In this case, more than any since I've put so much damn time into this. Thank you, enough rambling, it's time for me to get into my subjective list of every single mainline Zelda game ranked from worst to best. Leave your opinions down below as I'm just doing that too, but just in video form. Let's go! Number 18, Triforce Heroes. Now please do not get me wrong, I don't hate this game by any means. In fact, I think it's really cool that you can play this game with friends over Wi-Fi, but it fell flat in a lot of ways to me. First off, I believe the dungeons were fairly lackluster. I mean, the game barely had dungeons. It technically had sections to play rather than dungeons. Little puzzles that you'd have to solve. My main issue with these areas was definitely the repetitive nature of 90% of the puzzles being the utilization of the grouping mechanic. Especially in single player, having to pick a link up and switch into another link got pretty tedious pretty fast. As you may have gathered, this is the same for all of the multiplayer games, but this one doesn't have enough redeeming qualities for me to say that it's better than the other friendly play games. The atmosphere in this game is pretty much dormant from the snippets of the game that were memorable to me. The story is definitely there, and while it's not a giant thing, it was kind of cool to have the outfits in the game come out as part of the story technically. The story was definitely unique, but there wasn't much of a plot. Just a beginning and an end really. The items in this game definitely bring the overall enjoyment up a notch, while I don't think it has the most diverse items in any Zelda, there are some pretty cool ones in there, even though not all of them are used in the most meaningful ways. Right, now let's get on to the most obvious pick for one of the worst Zeldas ever. <laughs> Number 17, Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. If you're returning from previous videos then you probably know that like all other Zelda games I don't hate this game either. I do think it's tedious at times though, definitely. Do I think a remake could do it justice though? For sure. But anyway, the dungeons in this game are fairly plain overall. Since it was one of the two starters for the Zelda series and the NES dungeons hadn't been nearly as fleshed out as later games just yet, the dungeons could be considered somewhat annoying in some cases in fact, as some had hidden areas only accessed by walking through a solid wall. We'll talk about this a little more, but NES's era Zelda was a tedious mess at times, so while I don't think the dungeons were non-existent and the bosses in fact were pretty damn fun at times, it's not hitting those top ranked 2D dungeons for me. The open world in this game is both surprising and disappointing. Travelling around the overworld and seeing everything around you is really cool, and each town or village makes you realise just how important your mission is, but it self-destructs when the random encounters are mixed into it. Meaning that in most cases you can't really even avoid these enemies, and may take some damage. If you do take that damage, then that will carry over to your next dungeon or random encounter, making for a borderline aggravating experience at times. Next up is the atmosphere and story of the game. Considering the time that the game came out, it fared pretty well on this front. The dark and gloomy atmosphere and the story of Ganon being resurrected and Zelda being put to sleep was consistent throughout and made for one of the better stories in a 2D game, never mind it being the first time we met Dark Link. Last but not least in this case are the items, and oh boy, this game has a plethora of pretty cool items. Technically these were all spells, but they were cool nonetheless. Some of these include the ability to jump higher, heal a certain amount and turn into a fairy. Those were just some examples, but the game was wacky with some of its items. Though it didn't include many of them, so I can't rank it all that highly. If there were more of them, maybe. If we're all happy, then it's time to go to the, on to the next one. Number 16, The Legend of Zelda. Around this time 35 years ago, Nintendo fans were more than treated to the first official game in the Legend of Zelda franchise on the Nintendo Entertainment System. 
To this day, it stands as the beginning to one of the most consistently amazing franchises ever. Really, the fact that it's this low on the list should be a testament to just how consistent this series is. First up is the dungeons. While they lack a certain level of variety that later dungeons in the series offered, the game still offered some pretty cool dungeons and felt like the first real roguelike with a few differences. My main issues were the lack of variety as I've said and the fact that you were expected to randomly bomb different walls, making the game a tedious mess when you had no bombs left. Maybe to some this is a minor gripe and I'm entitled nowadays with the new Zelda games but those are my thoughts. Not bad dungeons but also not great. Very similar to Zelda 2's dungeons rankings wise. This was the first game in the series, and even so, it fled a similar style to Breath of the Wild. You are dropped into a world with nothing, you pick up your sword and you start fighting, as you play more the game gets easier. In that way the open world is very good, but of course, since the technology or budget wasn't there yet, the game had nothing like side quests to speak of in its open world, I mean not many games did, making it a decent open world but nothing to shout home about. The story so to speak is virtually non-existent, just keep travelling and killing these boss things I guess. When you've done it, you'll get a triangle and you'll save the princess. Game over. Done. Finished. The atmosphere is fairly upbeat down to the overworld music, but I'm really not sure how it fits the tone of the game, so it doesn't have a great score there. Finally, the items. Considering this was the first Zelda game, Link had a pretty outstanding item arsenal. All of the items that we really expect to see in our Zelda games nowadays with some cool outliers. All are on screen now, and while I've never felt compelled to use some of them, it was easily one of the strongest aspects of this game when ranking it. On to the next. Number 15, Four Swords Adventures. Possibly the least accessible game in the series comes next in the list. The sad thing here is that the game has serious potential. The dungeons are more dungeon-like than a game like Triforce Heroes for sure, but it still lacks the same adventure feel that the rest of the multiplayer games do. Exploring a dungeon should feel like real exploration, not just walking through a collection of rooms to fight a boss, at least in my opinion anyway. So it ranks pretty lowly with its dungeons in my opinion, though all links having their own screen for dungeons was a pretty cool concept. Much like Triforce Heroes, this game lacks something of an open world. It feels a lot more lively than that game's world since houses and other villages are present, so it's slightly higher in that regard and sometimes it feels like you're actually exploring, so I definitely consider it better in crafting a world that I'm keen to explore. The story is one of resurrecting Ganon once again, so it doesn't earn many points for overall creativeness, but I appreciate a little bit of effort in this department. The atmosphere is dark and that's very clear, but it's only really clear in the opening and ending sections of the game, so there's not much there either. Overall not bad, but not a great story and atmosphere either. The items present are once again kinda useful. Really, it uses the same load of items that were always present in the original few games and they were used to solve various puzzles. Overall, I think Four Swords Adventures isn't given nearly enough credit, but it's mostly down to how barely anyone can play the game due to it being on the GameCube and needing cables and Game Boys. What I'm trying to say here is, Nintendo, please put Four Swords Adventures on the Switch. <laughs> Number 14, Phantom Hourglass. This is the first game in the list that I would genuinely call a decent Zelda game. It happened to be one of my first Zelda games, but while it's great in a ton of areas, I also feel like there are certain aspects that drag the experience down a considerable amount. Let's start with dungeons as usual. In fact, let's start with dungeon. The one thing that brings down the experience pretty damn far, especially on repeat playthroughs, is the Temple of the Ocean King. If you're a part of the Zelda community, you probably know the discourse with this temple. Every time you complete a dungeon, you go back to the Temple of the Ocean King to open a new area up once again. In concept, this is pretty cool. Going back down to the depths to open up a new area sounds pretty fun until you have to run through the same dungeon upwards of five different times. And every time it becomes even easier as well. If the dungeon had any semblance of replayability, I'd be pretty happy with it, but it doesn't. I'll stop whining and say that the end of the dungeon makes it half worth it and the rest of the dungeons are pretty good. Nothing that rivals the 3D games dungeons in my opinion, but like a lot of the 2D games, the puzzles are non-stop and are brilliant from start to finish. The open world is fairly weak to me, but it's always cool to sail the open seas and shoot some enemies while sailing to the next island. The world isn't barren as there are some spirit gems, but I don't really see much of a reason to get them. There are also a few side quests, so overall I find the open world to be neither here nor there, a very average score. The atmosphere and story are the strongest that we've seen in a game so far. There are actual twists and turns with some surprise interactions with Limebeck. The character of Limebeck is also incredible with one of the best character arcs in a Zelda game, rivaling even Midna in my opinion. The atmosphere is spot on, the Hero of Winds has always been hopeful of what's to come. 
This carries into his second game and is perfectly represented through the music. The Hero of Winds item set in this game overall is fairly limited. Bombs, bomb chews, boomerang, bow, the grappling hook, a hammer. These are all pretty cool but are the bare minimum for a Zelda game in my opinion. This is by no means a bad game and I think it does get a bad reputation sometimes but I suggest you try it out if given the chance. Number 13. The Oracle games. Some of you might even be surprised that these games are so far up the list, but I really do think that they don't get what they deserve, and I think there needs to be remasters or a remake or something so that the new fans can try it out. A set of games lost by time if you will. I've piled these in together because I think they're similar enough to just stack together. Sorry if you think otherwise. Anyway, in my opinion the dungeons in this game are pretty forgettable overall, but are still much better than anything we've seen so far. The greatest dungeon here would be the Ancient Ruins. I think for a 2D game they got a lot right here. The atmosphere is great here and apart from the outstanding dungeons in Link to the Past and Link's Awakening, the dungeons overall really do make the game. Even if I did have to play through sections of the game again for this video just to make sure. There's nothing coherently amazing about them though, so they're just borderline good in my opinion. The open world is diverse in comparison to the other games we've talked about so far. It's the first game that had a sort of alternate overworld with the inclusion of Subrosia, and I think that increased my enjoyment of the game a pretty substantial amount. New races are always welcome to the series and they help to liven up the overworld. Apart from that, the game is your standard overworld with a few heart pieces and stuff like that. Subrosia knocked it up a bit more than the standard games though. The story to this game is sort of different to usual with many parallels. Instead of Zelda, it's Nehru or Din that you must save. There's a new antagonist in the form of Onox and Link slays Ganondorf once again. It's on rails but the story is still decent. The atmosphere is one better than most of the games so far I find. The setting of Subrosia does enough with lava and other sub characters that it instills that sense of adventure I expect when I start up a new Zelda game. Not to mention the animal companions, they were really cool. There's an argument here that the Oracle games have a load of items as you can just use rings to make Link's vitality and damage better. But I'm just going to count the rings as one, as I didn't really see a use for them in my first playthrough. The seeds have a similar situation, but Link being able to use the Gale seeds makes the game way cooler when you're in a rush. The rest of the items are the usual bomb chews, boomerangs, bows, shields, etc. But those small additions were plentiful. Number 12. Four Swords. I don't want to waste your time so I'll explain Four Swords like this. It's an amazing game and a really fun first multiplayer adventure. Like the other multiplayer games, the dungeons don't feel as grandiose as single player games but they're still a load of fun to travel through with friends. The open world is much less lively than in adventures but it's still more fun to explore than the wasteland that is Triforce Heroes map. The story is very similar to that of Four Swords Adventures, apart from the resurrection of Ganon. This kind of gives me a closer connection to Varty as a villain so I personally like this change a lot. The items are pretty much identical to the other games that were made at the time. Very similar to Four Swords Adventures overall, but it only just beats out the Oracle games for me. I still wish I got the Anniversary Edition when it was released on the DS, never mind, maybe in future. <laughs> Number 11, Spirit Tracks. This is technically the sequel to Phantom Hourglass, though it starts you off with a whole new Link, a concept I simply couldn't wrap my head around as a kid. But here I am now making videos on Zelda, crazy how things change so quickly. What are the dungeons in this game like then? Well, to compare it to Phantom Hourglass, I believe the dungeons overall are slightly better and this game doesn't possess the Temple of the Ocean King. Huge thank you to the Zelda team for that one. Instead it seems like they took the feedback from the Temple of the Ocean King and instead of making you walk through all of the puzzles you've already done, you can just walk straight past them. The temple or tower in this game was called the Tower of Spirits. I found it to be slightly more interesting overall as you can control certain areas using a phantom whilst playing a Zelda. A neat little gimmick. Like I said, I don't think the dungeons do too much right in comparison to Phantom Hourglass, I just think this is where they found their stride with the DS games, before stopping the storyline entirely of course. The open world is probably a little bit worse than Phantom Hourglass however. I really loved exploring the train tracks but I really wanted to just be free to go wherever I wanted to go at one point, like in Phantom Hourglass really. Plus I think the enemy trains just came off as kind of annoying when you were trying to go places sometimes. The story is a little all over the place most of the time but it's definitely ambitious for a DS title. I mean Zelda literally dies and Maladus' accomplice Staven or Starvin or I don't know how uh, I don't know how you say it, <laughs> turns to the good side at the end. There's a pretty meaty story there, not much in the way of a general atmosphere but most individual areas have plenty of character. Overall maybe a little above average there. The item situation is almost identical to Phantom Hourglass, which also means it's lacking some true items. 
Maybe this is down to hardware issues or whatever, but the point is that the game falls off a little in the items department. Now it's time to get into the big top 10. This is where I think people are going to start having slight issues with the ranking. <laughs> Number 10, Skyward Sword. Look, okay, it's my least like 3D Zelda, but I have a feeling that that will all change soon, as a lot of my problem with this game was the motion controls. Another slight issue I had though is addressed right here, so let's get on with it. First off is the dungeons, and for me so far this is without a doubt the best in the dungeon department. I don't think that they are as consistent as I would like dungeons to be, but particular highlights are the sand ship, the ancient cistern, and skyview temple. The theming for each of these dungeons is done to a relentless level. The ancient cistern rams the peaceful atmosphere down your throat, but then switches it up and juxtaposes this with the bottom of the cistern. It makes one of my favourite themes for any dungeon ever. Not to mention most of the bosses in this game are pretty darn good apart from their glaring weaknesses. Overall, I believe the dungeons are great. Not amazing, but pretty good. The open world is definitely there. Skyward Sword is nowhere near as linear as one of the multiplayer games, and it's pretty cool how each area changes throughout the story, but I just found that it didn't make for good exploration personally. It felt like there was no need to return to the areas in my own time. Maybe I'm on my own here, but I don't know. It's not the worst offender of this, but it makes the game slightly less enjoyable for my own personal taste. Though the side quests in the story are some of the best in the series, so I could bump it up a little bit here. Next up is the story and atmosphere, and this game is no doubt the best yet for this. The story itself is a fairly bland one. Plenty of bumps in the road, but the goal mostly remains the same. To stop Girahim, and in turn Demise. And it does give us the lore revelation that Demise placed a curse on Link and Zelda, so story-wise the game is a big fight, yes. The atmosphere, while drowned out sometimes down to its watercoloured art style, I feel is mostly at a very large high. Walking into Farron Woods or into the desert for the first time really makes you feel like you're actually travelling through one of these areas. That along with the motion controls made a truly immersive experience in most areas. All of these things mix together very well to give it a nice score on the bar here, though some points have been deducted since I think the story itself is a bit too linear for my liking. But again, that is a personal preference thing, and maybe that is your sort of thing. The final thing I'll talk about here is items, and while I personally don't think the game wins any awards in this area, I will boot it to an above average score for two things. One, the items in Skyward Sword were mostly completely new, and were amazing in some cases, and I wish we got some of them again. The second reason is because you can also upgrade some of these items, which also kind of gives the game a sort of replay value, along with the obvious fact that it can make items useful once more. My real main issue here is that there isn't many items you can really use. If the game had more items, it would be gunning for a top spot. That's how tight these picks really are from now on. Number 9, Link's Awakening. This is definitely the first 2D Zelda game that I looked at when making this list and knew it was going to be in the top 10. Link's Awakening is one of the most charm-filled Zelda adventures, and while the art style to the Switch remake was and still is debated by fans, I don't think anyone can deny that the art style added to the overall charm and lightness of the world. The Animal Village, Mabe Village, but here we go. Compared to the rest of the 2D games I've mentioned so far, Link's Awakening far exceeds what's been a good dungeon so far. Each dungeon has an identity and they're actually memorable. I didn't have to search up some of the dungeons in the game, unlike Spirit Tracks in the Oracle games. These are pure fun and are fun in ways that I never thought possible for 2D Zelda until I played this game on the Game Boy. The puzzles are unique and I don't think I ever felt that the dungeons felt tedious unlike a lot of the dungeons earlier on in the series. When Link's Awakening released on the Switch, I played through it four times in the space of two months. Once normally with zero deaths, once on hard mode and once at an attempt for zero deaths in hard mode. And even now I could happily say that I'm not bored of these dungeons. In my opinion, Link's ahead of all of the 2D dungeons so far. Eagle's Tower is one of the single coolest dungeons in the series that ends off with a satisfying boss fight. Apart from Skyward Sword, this game is also packing a great open world. Small little side quests to do and even returning characters in the form of Marin, Tarin and some other key characters. This along with a trading sequence that is, well, it's not going to win awards but it's pretty darn satisfying by the end. Each village has its own group of characters and in turn can come some small side quests. Most of the things you can do for seashells and heart pieces are all outside of villages, but in Mabe Village, for example, you can play the trendy game and you can go fishing for heart pieces. Seashells can also unlock certain abilities, so overall, this game offers a little more than most 2D games in the open world department. The story and atmosphere can be judged by two things, the original game and the remake. In this case, I'm going to use the remake as I feel it does slightly more justice and really the art style just complements story. 
The toy-like atmosphere, diorama-like structures, and compelling story creates a brilliant sense of immersion that most 2D games in general can't master. I call it a compelling story, but maybe it could be slightly more interesting in some areas. I feel that the bosses slowly lean you to the conclusion to the game and somewhat satisfying end make for possibly the best and most engaging story in a 2D Zelda game. The vignette and overall art style even adds to the story in this case, which is mostly why I've used the remake for my ranking. There's not that many great items in the game either, but it's expected from the fourth game in the series, though a couple of notable exceptions was the Rock's Cape and Pegasus Boots. Rock's Cape allowed the user to jump and the Pegasus Boots allowed Link to turn, so overall I'd say that the item arsenal is pretty average. Now to move off from the toys and onto a game most of you will definitely know. Number 8, A Link to the Past. This is a fan favourite for sure. I know that a ton of people in my Discord server believe that this is the best game in the series. Also, please do go and check out the Discord, it's on my pinned tweet, okay cool. But I can see why, and as I've said before, the list gets extremely tight around now, and as you can probably see with these bars getting closer and closer together when comparing them each time, it was pretty darn close to putting Link's Awakening above Link to the Past, and that's kind of crazy, but let's talk about why I didn't. First off, all of the dungeons. This is the first Zelda game that actually did dungeons right. It's also the first game that decided there was a formula to the series now. So I think for that, I've already got it to a higher standard. Without this game, we wouldn't have what we have now, or the later games in the series that I think turned out even better than this one. Dungeons are memorable, as you'd expect them to be. Considering this was the first Zelda that rolled with the idea of atmosphere playing a big role when you walk into a dungeon, instead of it just being dark, the music and sprite work in the game could instill a sense of danger rather than... Go on. Run ahead, keep going. I sh probably shouldn't hold it to a higher standard because of it being the first game to create dungeons that we all know and love and want back, but I just can't stop myself. It sticks itself a point above Link's Awakening with its dungeons. Considering the open world in the original two games and the fact that there wasn't too much to do apart from get to your goal, this game largely innovated in this front for future titles as well. Heart pieces were now everywhere and it felt like there was a real reason for you to be exploring the world. I don't think it's the best 2D open world in a Zelda game, as you'll see later, but it's pretty darn good, largely creating a lot of the stuff we love to see in open worlds nowadays. Again, Link to the Past was largely the forefront to innovations made in games like Ocarina of Time, but considering the time, the atmosphere that the Zelda team created was superb. The story starts you off with your uncle dying and all hope seems lost. Link is that beacon of hope and considering this is the first Zelda story, it's pretty darn good. The atmosphere set is doom and gloom until the hero starts his quest. The music picks up and you really feel like you're on an adventure. Ever since, the Zelda team have tried to do that time and time again. They've succeeded, but this game has done it first. The items at the hero's disposal are slightly better overall than Link's Awakening's barrage of weaponry as the medallions carve their way into the lineup and as stupid as it sounds, this game was the first with the different coloured tunics that can actually really feel like they make a difference, not just, you know, the white tunic. So, it tops some of the other games a little there. I hope you can all agree with my placement, uh, I can see the comments now, but on to the next one. Number 7, The Minish Cap. Possibly the most underrated game in the series. Or is it? I'm not even sure anymore. Everyone who's played Minish Cap knows without a doubt that it is an outstanding game. My friend who's played about 6 games in the series has played about half of this game and it is still his favourite 2D entry. There's a variety of reasons why I feel like this is true as well. Though one more 2D game may lie above it. Dungeons wise, I think this is almost very nearly the best collection of dungeons in a 2D game. Even Deepwood Shrine, the game's first dungeon comes off as straight up amazing. The sprite work inside of the dungeons is also just as amazing really. And hey look at that, some thought actually went into the bosses. You have to unlock areas of light to unlock a final boss battle in an ice dungeon in which you go up against a giant iced up Octorok. There's something incredibly charming about the dungeons. They're very nearly perfect, but miss the mark a little, which is expected since the game was made in part by Capcom. Sometimes I felt that it didn't hit that certain Zelda spark, but honestly, it barely matters. Even so, they managed to create some of the best dungeons in the series, and some of the more fun challenges in the form of the bosses. The open world is probably the most fulfilling area of this game. There's never a dull moment while exploring Minish Cap's take on Hyrule. Kinstones were one of the most notable changes and they were pretty nice. They were just another thing to add into the world to make it even more fun to explore. Apart from this, you also had the usual heart pieces, as you could find swordsman scrolls, which greatly increased the amount of fun you could have with the combat. This also counts for items, so keep that in mind when I talk about items later on. Overall, the sprite work just played into that, so let's talk about the atmosphere a little more. 
I think the atmosphere present in this game is at the very least better than Link to the Past. I'm not so sure about Link's Awakening, but the main reason why I think this is the case is because of those rare cases in which you turn into a minish and you can see everything else at your size. Massive droplets of water, dirt, books, they're all giant and it gives this world a bit more liveliness. This game features Varty, which I feel is always a nice little change of pace since we see Ganon so much, and while the story isn't Final Fantasy 7 layers of good, it's pretty good for a Zelda. So the atmosphere and story are pretty good all things considered. The items in this game are both great and underwhelming. First off there are two shields, two boomerangs and bombs as usual. These all seem to be shoveled into most Zelda games so this is why I find it underwhelming. But the variety that the mole mitts, pegasus boots, rocks cape, the gust jar and cane of parky? I'm going to say parky. Are all very exciting to add to Link's moveset, which places his arsenal much higher than average in my opinion. While I don't think this is the best 2D game, it's a very close second. Now that we're getting to the top 6 though, we're getting to the big hitters. Number 6, Wind Waker. There is a chance that some people think that I hate this game because of the highly in debate video that I did with Nehru almost a whole year ago now. That's not the case at all. There's barely any points between all of these top games, and since I haven't mentioned the art style that much in my points, but I do believe that it is the best in the series simply for the fact that I don't think it'll ever actually feel aged or dated at all. But with that said, this video is already way too long, so let's get to the point. Dungeons. Dragon Roost Cavern is my favourite dungeon in this game by quite a lot, and I really think that they made a great first dungeon in this case in particular. I think the Tower of Gods is definitely up to scuff as well, but I liked the setting of Dragon Roost Cavern much more personally. I also think that the little section in the dungeon where you're driven to break wooden barriers by lighting the stick on fire and touching the other barriers was a neat way of showcasing the physics. It really showed a big change to the physics system in Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time. Overall, I think the dungeons aren't bad by any means. The two I've already mentioned, the Forbidden Woods and the Earth Temple, are all pretty good to great dungeons. I know opinions are mixed on both of the Earth and the Wind Temple, so I'll leave that up to you guys. Then the game drops off. Two dungeons were kicked out of the game due to development times. If it wasn't for this, I really think it would be my favourite game in the series. The first half of the game is as good as any game. If it wasn't for the second half, it would be the best in the series by a ton of points for me. Above average dungeon score for me. The Open World. It's one of the better open worlds in the linear games in my opinion. I've seen people say that it is pretty barren, but compared to the rest of the Zelda games, it's pretty damn full. There's a few ways that they managed to do this with the treasure charts, a few side quests scattered here and there, small little islands that offer nothing but a small chest. Some of these islands aren't even really needed, but they're very much optional and are crafted with this in mind. You can tell the world has had a lot of thought gone into it overall. I'll talk more about this aspect in a while, but the whole pirate theme is done amazingly to fit the theme. My one issue with the open world really, and the reason why it doesn't reach two of the other games in the series to the best open world is purely because the side quests in this game aren't as compelling as I'd like. Nothing like Skyward Sword's side quest, definitely a small area to improve there. The atmosphere and story, so let's get back to that pirate theming. It's done to an alarming extent, it's crazy that this game, made for the Gamecube, stands as one of the best pirate simulator games in 2021. Treasure charts, finding random chests full of rupees in the ocean, the rumoured ghost ship that's been roaming around the ocean at certain times in the day depending on the day, a pirate crew whom the residents of multiple villages are terrified of, being raided by, all of this makes me want to actually sail the seas in Tetra's pirate ship. I'm still gunning for Breath of the Wild 2 having a pirate ship in at some point, it'd just be such a cool idea to me, but the atmosphere accomplishes a similar thing by just being so hopeful, which also runs with pirates being hopeful and getting treasure. Wow, a pirate Breath of the Wild 2 video might be coming soon. Safe to say the atmosphere is spot on, but how about the story? It is pretty decent. I think another game did a similar twist a bit better, and you'll see that later on in the video, but spoiler warning for Wind Waker right now, it turns out that Tetra is in fact Princess Zelda. I think it's extremely obvious this is going to happen from the opening stages, and the game heavily foreshadows this happening, but it is still a decent twist nonetheless. The main thing that makes this story good is Ganondorf's character. He is no longer driven by rage, instead he's driven by his childhood, by the poverty of his land compared to the rich lives that Hylian's got to live before the goddesses drowned Hyrule, and he just wants it back. A manic laugh while his dreams are crushed is the final nail on the coffin for him. The story can be improved, but it's a good story overall. Much higher than average in this department. Items. I personally think that in terms of overall usefulness, these items are probably the best in the list yet. Here are a few. The Deku Leaf, the Grappling Hook, the Hook Shot, the Mirror Shield, the Boomerang and the Bow. While these mostly seem pretty mundane, any 3D game with a real hook shot is made better for that reason. 
The Deku Leaf and Grappling Hook in particular are great additions, as one has you flying over insanely giant gaps, and the other can see Link swing over large gaps when prompted. A good weapon lineup for sure in my opinion, one of the better ones at least. While it's not my favourite, it's pretty close, and is closest to a true pirate adventure I've ever been given, and for that I'm grateful for. On to the next one. Number 5, Link Between Worlds. We're finally here, my favourite 2D Zelda game and there are a ton of reasons for it you'll see in a second. But first off, the graphics were near on perfect on the 3DS, and the reusing of a Link to the Past world with a new gimmick really works in this game's favour. In fact, the gimmick of travelling on the world's walls was used so incredibly well that it's a reason why some of these categories go up a point. Now let's get into the dungeons before I keep gushing. The dungeons are good by themselves, but the inclusion of the painting mechanic is crazy good in this case. Sometimes a dungeon will have you walking through countless areas that you normally wouldn't be able to get to. Instead, you can walk on the wall as it is and boom, you're there. The dungeons require you to think outside the box, and I personally really like that aspect of it. Some may disagree with this, but I think that by a game's dungeons purely being in the 3D, I find them more atmospheric overall. Like, I could actually be walking through one of the dungeons in real life. So while it's technically not the game's fault, I will be deducting a couple of points or a point away for that. But overall, I think all of the dungeons have their own identity, and the Thieves hideout in particular is a highlight for the entire game. If they decide to do a proper 2D Zelda again soon, I hope they incorporate a lot of ideas hit used here as a first benchmark. As usual now we go to the open world for the game, and I do think they improved on this a little after A Link to the Past personally. Again, I clearly don't think A Link to the Past is bad, I just think some improvements were made. One of the coolest collectibles was the Mai Mai. These were scattered all over the world and required the player to pry them off using Painting Link. I really like these collectibles, but I could be in the minority so I am sorry if that's the case, but I really love to just explore this map. I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's the graphics or the overall atmosphere, but the game oozes creativity and re-exploring Hyrule and Lowrule, even though it's technically the dark world, I'm, I'm not sure. I think this was just a way more fun open world to explore than most of these games to me, and I can't really put my finger on why. So here's this score. The story and atmosphere is about the same as A Link to the Past really, in both departments. The story is one of a villain trying to resurrect Ganon, in both cases the story is one of saving Hyrule and the Dark World in a sense. So I can't rank the story over or under A Link to the Past, it'd be doing both of the games a disservice. I've said this almost too much during this video, but I think I'm in the minority here. I believe that the items in A Link Between Worlds are the best in any of the 2D games I've mentioned so far. Perhaps you disagree, but the variety given to the player by giving them items like the Tornado Rod, Sand Rod, Ice Rod, Hook Shot, Hint Glasses and much more is very good. I also happen to think that the Ravio system of buying weapons was a lot better than many people say, so I've also bumped it up a point for that. Definitely an experiment, but not an experiment that I think went coherently wrong at all personally. Maybe this is lower on your list, but it ranks here for me, and I think that it was a great entry for the series and came off as the best 2D game. It makes me excited for the future of 2D Zelda. Number 4, Breath of the Wild. Some of you may have expected this at the top of my list, since everyone seems to be doing that nowadays, but truthfully, even if I thought so, I truly don't think I could do it all justice. There are so many key differences and problems with Breath of the Wild that it is crazy, but it makes me even more hopeful for the future of the series, and that is one of the main reasons why I believe it's in my top 5 Zelda games. One of its first problems is its so called original dungeons, the Divine Beasts. I plan to make a larger video on just this topic at some point, as it's been in my notes for a ridiculous amount of time now, but I find that they just include no challenge in combat, they have uninspired bosses and are just puzzle casing that can be solved in less than 20 minutes. So I didn't really like those dungeons. Without a small little thing I like to call shrines, there would be no way that Breath of the Wild would be this far up the list. I mean, you guys know how important dungeons are to me, but the shrines in Breath of the Wild have such a good mixture of puzzles, combat with the strength shrines and exploration with the labyrinths that I am more than happy to give Breath of the Wild an above average score in dungeons. I mean, there are 120 shrines with different things to do to complete. Most of them and Hyrule Castle happens to be the coolest format for a dungeon in a Zelda game to date. And I sincerely hope that they continue to try and go down the open format rabbit hole that they seem to have started trying. I can only hope they do at some point. Next is the open world, and again I could make an entire video on this, but I will shorten it down. 120 shrines, 900 Korok seeds, multiple locations to just explore for the sake of exploration, burnt down buildings in which you can uncover what happened 100 years ago, upgrades, a memory section that we'll talk about a bit more later, materials to collect, and a ton of different traversal methods, makes Breath of the Wild the best world in the series so far. 
And even though I give it a 10 in the open world area, I still believe one game has it beat out, since Breath of the Wild only really had one meaningful side quest in the form of Tarrytown. I hope there are some more substantial side quests in future. On to the story and atmosphere. The story is one of tragedy. Hyrule's ruin. Link's death and eventual come up, it all culminates perfectly into something that I'm sure we'll see the end to, or at least the next chapter to in the next game. While the story isn't amazing by itself, it's so new for Zelda that I automatically hold it to a higher pedigree I think. Plus it runs over to the overall atmosphere of the game so seamlessly that it is insane. Some complain that the music isn't as good as the old Zelda games and I'm sorry, but I simply cannot agree. If you actually listen to the soundtrack online, the songs are so great but yet so subtle. Those small piano notes add to the atmosphere, and the piano notes being used at all are used to remind you of a time 100 years before even now, when pianos were more common. So yes, I think that the game has it knit into its very design that the atmosphere is one of a tranquil nature. Maybe I'm giving the game too much credit, but considering the task at hand and the subtleness in which they did it, I give the story and atmosphere a 10 overall. Bear in mind the atmosphere does carry the score. Some of you may not think that Breath of the Wild's items deserve this score, but I think they deserve a big fat 8. Crayonis, Stasis, Magnesis and Bombs give so much power to the player that it's insane. I don't even want to know how long some of these took to develop, and they can make the world and combat just that much better. Speedrunners have literally made ways to traverse using these items, and I think they can run with these sorts of ideas in future. Though, I need a hookshot. I hope that's at least a uh, decent amount of explanation here. Overall, there's a lot more to do in very small areas. If it was slightly more optimised, it would grab a top place, and I hope that we see that in a sequel. A dark, gloomy sequel? That's maybe everything I ever want? Number 3, Majora's Mask. This is a very divisive title in the community I've grown to see. A lot of people don't really like or appreciate the time mechanic, and I can fully appreciate that. It's personally not a worry for me, which is why I'll say now that this pick is fully subject to change on anybody's list. I have one rather large issue with this game, and I'm sure anyone who's played it knows exactly what it is. And look at that, that's perfect timing to get into the dungeons. Now the thing is, these dungeons are not bad by any means. Most of these dungeons, however, are also not good by any means. There's one outlier in my opinion that is a genuinely great dungeon. But even then, I think it only reaches Ocarina of Time's okay dungeons in quality. That's the Stone Tower Temple. The biggest reason why I think this is because the dungeon flips around halfway through. And seriously, I still don't think it's anything special. Nothing really drives me to finish the dungeon apart from the inevitable ending of the timer. Maybe I'd think it was better if the timer wasn't there at all, but that isn't the reality we live in here. The rest of the dungeons are just okay, but they keep up their theming so much that I feel like I can still happily round this score up to a 7. A similar level to Breath of the Wild. This may annoy some, but all of the good is coming soon. The open world is the first thing to gush about. Side quests are plentiful and give you literally everything in the world to do. This is unanimously the best game in the Zelda series in the side quest area. Each one happens at different times and can give you a ton of stuff like masks. Even barring that, Termina is a very lively world, and I think the time mechanic only enhances this part of the game. But you know what comes next. Boom. Crashing straight through the bar itself is Majora's Mask story and atmosphere, and this is purely for the atmosphere. Just like Breath of the Wild, the atmosphere is seriously, insanely, crazily good. But even better, I've made an entire video on it in the past, and I just think the atmosphere is crazy brilliant in this game. You really should check that video out, I'm not going to leave a card because, yeah, but really, this game's atmosphere is crazy good. From the off, the game establishes an amazing piece of atmospheric art by throwing the mask at you already. This game has been known to genuinely upset people, and while that can be seen as a bad thing, I really think that that's just a testament to just how perfectly they made a depressing vibe. There are such intricate details that you won't even notice until a second time or even a third time through. I highly suggest my Majora's Mask Atmosphere video if you want to hear my take on that a little bit more. I'll talk about this game's items slightly more soon as you might have noticed that Ocarina of Time ranks above it and a lot of the items are reused from that game, but I do think that the masks were very clever inclusions that really enhanced the experience and story in this game, with characters basically dying for you to use their skin, really, which adds to the story in itself. The Goron and the Zora in particular were awesome items and using the Fierce Deities Mask to finish off Majora after collecting masks all the way through the game is so satisfying. So yeah, this game has decent items overall that change up the way that the game is played. This game has an amazing amount of detail poured into it, I can only hope we see more detail like this in the future. Now we get into the top 2. Which will it be? Ocarina of Time or Twilight Princess? Let's find out. 
For many, this was the first game in the series, and also for a lot of people, this is the best game in the series, and maybe even the best game in the world. I mean, a lot of people seem to agree that Ocarina of Time is just one of the best games ever made but it only ranks at number two on my list, and I know some people might be slightly annoyed by this, but again, it is just my opinion, and I'm gonna give some reasons why, and then I'll tell you why Twilight Princess is better, of course. Or, oh, in my opinion, oh god. Right, dungeons. Ocarina of Time has some of the best dungeons in the series. I'm not even gonna kid around it. Ocarina of Time, dungeons, all the way up. Crack through the bar again, just like Majora's Mask's atmosphere. Each dungeon in this game is perfectly crafted and has clearly had a lot of thought put into it. The first dungeon in the game inside the Deku Tree is the first dungeon ever in a 3D game and they perfectly represented what it meant to have a 3D dungeon and the atmosphere needed. The music starts off and it's like, it's so atmospheric, there's something insanely good about how they set the tone to that dungeon. Again, Dodongo's Cavern. Arguably even better in design and theming. I personally don't like it as much as inside the Deku Tree, but it's still pretty good. Inside Jabu Jabu's Belly is the one outlier here. It's possibly the worst dungeon in the game, but I still find it kind of fun. Uh, I might be gutted for saying that, but never mind. The Forest Temple. This is an atmospheric masterpiece. Again, I hope to do dungeon analysis in the future, so I would really love to talk about that a bit more in the future, but the atmosphere and just how it's all set with the decrepit building and everything, it's really, really well made. And the design itself is very fun for the Forest Temple in particular, making it possibly one of my favorite dungeons in the series, at least in the top three. Now, I don't wanna keep going through all of the dungeons. You get my point. This game had some truly spectacular dungeons. So ridiculously good to say that it was the first game in the 3D series. That is absolutely mental. Twilight Princess is the only one that's even come close to really replicating how good the dungeons are in Ocarina of Time. But anyway, I, I should probably move on to the open world. Now, for me, the open world is neither here nor there in Ocarina of Time. I think Majora's Mask did the side quest side of it a hell of a lot better the second time around. And really, I never feel like I have to explore Ocarina of Time's world, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth the exploration. When I do explore it, it's a lot of fun to just come through and slowly get heart pieces and stuff. And the world, especially in the 3D version, is crafted with such precise accuracy that it's just great. Certain details and easter eggs that you might miss are just scattered all around the place, and really, again, while it isn't as good as Majora's Mask or Breath of the Wild in this case, I do think that it deserves a top spot from everything else, so here we go I guess, open world done. The story in the atmosphere, as I've said a billion times during this already, this was the first 3D Zelda game, but that didn't mean that the story and atmosphere were bad. In fact, they were probably one of the best stories and atmospheres so far. Majora's Mask obviously did it better, and I think Breath of the Wild might have done it a bit better, but the whole thing about the first 3D Zelda game was that they wanted to create that sense of, wow, you're Link, and you're really going to go on an adventure, and you're going to go and try and slay Ganondorf, who's basically taken the entire town in ruin. Even when you travel in time and go forward seven years, the game tries to stick with this. It's, it still tries to be hopeful. But even then, re-deads and stuff, they really juxtapose this nature. And I think that it's perfectly crafted. The story itself is also pretty good. It's not going to win any awards or anything, but being able to see Ganondorf who has, you know, he's manipulated the royal family and slowly plots to kill Hyrule, technically, I think that it's done very well. And, and considering this was the first 3D game, they couldn't have really made a better story. So for me, this section gets a 10. Now the items. I have this on the same level as Majora's Mask purely because they must have made the items for Ocarina of Time. Maybe some of you will say that's unfair, and to be honest, I would maybe agree with you. But the thing is, having to make the hookshot and all of those different items, the hookshot, the bow, even the bombs and stuff, in 3D for the first time must have taken an incredible amount of time. And I think they're all very useful, they actually open up the world unlike most of these other games, so... I think the items are also great. Now, Ocarina of Time, possibly, maybe even my favourite game of all time, really. If I really think about it way too hard, I could maybe put Ocarina of Time above Twilight Princess. But it's so tight this time around that I can't, alright? Twilight Princess is just better in my opinion. So, that leads me on to this. 
Number one, Twilight Princess. First of all, the dungeons. Uh, this is easily Twilight Princess's best aspect. I will instantly say, bar, it's gone through the bar. It is done. There's no bar now. <laughs> the dungeons are crafted superbly. While some people such as Nehru would probably disagree with me, Arbiter's Grounds, in fact, no, he wouldn't disagree with Arbiter's Grounds, but Arbiter's Grounds is an amazingly designed dungeon. Star Lord is the boss is such an amazing conclusive ending. And really the theming and design of the whole desert aspect has really never been done to that extent before. Spirit Temple came pretty close, but I personally like Arbiter's Ground slightly more. And really since you can see it in Breath of the Wild, it even enhances that even just a tiny smidge more. Most of the bosses in this game feel kind of new. You see, my issue with Wind Waker in particular is that a lot of the bosses just felt like they were reskinned. Like the massive bird, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but they were just Volvagia, but a bird. Like there were certain things with Wind Waker in particular that just didn't sit well with the bosses for me. And I know I haven't talked about bosses all that much, but Twilight Princess's bosses really do deserve a mention. Some of them had pretty obvious flaws, but the point is new bosses always a win for me and dungeons in general, Yes, this is like the most dungeons in any Zelda game ever, I believe. I, I might be wrong with that, maybe Ocarina of Time still has the same amount. But I personally like these dungeons so much more that it just it just ranks above. I think the first few dungeons maybe aren't that good, but from Arbus's Grounds onwards, amazing dungeons in that game. Like, without a doubt. The open world, this is Twilight Princess's weakest aspect by a country mile. I'm still going to rank it at the same level as Ocarina of Time though. I really like the horseback riding and sometimes your horseback battles, which is really why I'm going to round this up one more point. Maybe I should still be putting it lower, but I like how the heart containers are just kind of spread around. It makes me actually want to explore Hyrule Field rather than just, right, I guess this is just a massive plane with nothing. None of the Zelda games have ever made me feel like that, but there's a high chance that Twilight Princess could have done that. Uh, there are a few side quests. I find uh, the Agatha side quest to be slightly tedious, every, even though everybody loves that. And the Poe one is pretty fun because of the whole Wolf Link mechanic. And even exploring the open world as Wolf Link makes the game 10 times more replayable for me. I think the game has a very slow start that I don't think I'll mention anywhere else in here, so I'll quickly mention it here. The game has a very slow start, normally taking about three hours to really get into the main first dungeon, and that is a downfall. If the game started a little bit earlier, then I would really, like, it, 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 uh, I'd, I'd still go up another point, I'm sorry. But like, they didn't, so that's fine. I still love Twilight Princess to pieces. I, again, I need to stop gushing, otherwise this is just going to be 50 more minutes of Twilight Princess. Story and atmosphere. I told you earlier that Wind Waker had a competitor for its story and like how they did it. Well, I think Twilight Princess did it better than Wind Waker. There are a few different things here. First of all, Tetra was just a pirate and turns into the princess. That's no enemy. The thing is with Twilight Princess, I think that by like luring the player into a false sense of Zant is the bad guy, kill Zant, try and finish Zant off. And then realizing that Ganondorf is truly behind all of the actions, that Zant is just basically a puppet, I really think that it enhanced the story for me. All of the twists and turns in that game are crazy good. And even when like Midna is dying and slowly dissipating on Link's back, it's still extremely emotional to see one of the main characters slowly dying. And then Zelda technically takes her own life for Midna. This has the strongest story in a Zelda game apart from maybe Majora's Mask, in my opinion. I think. There's a few things that they could have done even better, but I don't expect it from the Zelda team from being completely honest. I think they're good at what they do, I don't know if they're really cut out for storytelling, but this game shows how capable they are of doing this kind of stuff. Some people say that the characters are just used and they're never seen again. I don't see that. The Ordonian kids are used all throughout the entire game. By the end of the game, you still have Colin who's trying to be a hero with you. Mallow is literally running his own mart following you wherever you go really i don't see how anyone can say that personally but i don't know it's personal preference and i get that so items this game i think has the biggest arsenal for link as well and has probably the most variation out of any of the item lists so i'm giving it another big big score 
I just think that the ball and chain, the spinner, and the claw shots in particular, I know the claw shots have been seen after that, but the claw shots in particular, they're real great additions. The claw shots were like double shot hook shots, I guess. <laughs> and I think they really helped in the City in the Sky dungeon. I just think they brought a load of variation and sometimes they were maybe underused. I will definitely admit that. But I think that these are still just my favorite items in the game to use, like the spinner. If the spinner was used more, oh my, <laughs> I would be constantly on the spinner, but it wasn't. But it wasn't a very cool Starlord fight. And I feel like the dungeons themselves that house these items are normally used to such an extent with the items that it doesn't really matter all that much in the grand scheme of things. Well, that was Twilight Princess. And while I think I might do a larger retrospective video on all of these games eventually, I think we've finally hit the end. I thank you all so much for watching this. If you watched all the way to the end, then first off leave a comment because Jesus, you are, you're the real MVP here, okay? I made this video in a week as I've said, and it feels kind of surreal how long this video is. I've always wanted to do the ranking video and it's always just been on my mind. So I'd really love it if you, if you liked, please like the video. If you're here, like the video and comment, okay? I, I respond to every single comment. There could be 5,000 comments on this video. I would still try and respond to every single one of them, okay? Please do leave your list down below. Don't make it as long as this script was. This script ended up being 15 pages. If you make 15 pages on YouTube of a, a ranking, I feel like my entire comment section might die. But it's real. I, I really appreciate every single one of you that was either waiting for this video or actually watched all the way through. For two reasons. One, you're helping my watch time, which I really like. Two, this is my favorite video on the channel. I've not edited this yet, obviously, but it's still my favorite video on the channel. I've wanted to do this since day one. I have a background from a year ago that's the ranking of every single game. And I've been slowly building it up in that time. So again, I, I might be coming off as sappy, but I really do thank you a lot. I mean, even my dad's been helping out with this video. So um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, like the video if you enjoyed. This video was brought to you in small part by my patrons. Um, Sumji is on screen right now. He is the biggest patron and I need to give him a way bigger thank you at some point, but thank you so much. I don't know how many people are going to see this thank you, Sumji, but there you go anyway. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to join them, then you can from £1 a month or about $1.50. I'm not sure how exchange rates are. One last time, I thank you for watching this video. I'm not sure if these videos will ever be this long ever again. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next week for another slightly less long video that takes a lot less time to edit. Alright, thank you. Bye. Stay safe.